Good Friday morning and welcome to Finding God in the Dark uh, after a week off. My name is Pastor Don Stevens. I serve Asbury UMC in Woodstown and St. John's in Harrisonville. John. Uh, Reverend Jonathan Campbell, I serve Lacey and I Methodist Church in Forked River, New Jersey. And this week we are going to talk about another Martin Scorsese film, uh, Kundun. Kundun? I don't know, okay. pronunciation, I'll, okay. I'll mess it up, okay. I'm sure. Um, it is a, did I read it? In, I don't have my notes up. 1997? Yeah, 1997 film. And yeah. uh, basically follows the story of the 14th, 14th Dalai Lama, yeah. who was, at the time the film was made, still in exile yeah. in India. Still is, yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'm going to... I'm going to jump into this one with both. Sure. None of the three of us had seen it ahead of time, but yeah. um, it was, I found it really difficult to follow. Mm. Uh, and I don't know if it was just, I was distracted because sure. it was, you know, I'd been away for a week and then I came yeah. back and I jumped right into BBS and I'm trying to watch this movie. And, uh, I think it was a little of that. I think a little that it is a very slow burn of a film. Yeah. Um, and a little bit, I think just the, the accents were throwing me off at times. So yeah. I had a, you know, and really until it kind of picked up with all of the political drama. Yeah. It wasn't the, the most of the beginning of the film. I'm just, I was lost. Yeah. You know, um, I, I don't know if you know this. Um, I'm sure the viewers don't, but Buddhism has been a big part of my life. In fact, it's been a big part of actually bringing me back to Christian faith. And that's a conversation for another podcast. But, okay, sure. <laughs> but um, reading the Dalai Lama and his encouragement, not for people to leave their faith, but to find the kind of roots of their own tradition and claiming it, it was a big part of me kind of coming back to Christianity in my 20s. Hmm. Um, and meditation and Buddhist practices like uh, especially uh, what's called meta meta or um, meta meditation, where you focus on like loving somebody, like especially if you're struggling with forgiving somebody and you kind of picture them and you wish them good health, you know, uh, a great life kind of thing and you kind of wish that for them and you visualize them has been a big part of me working through conflicts in my life so that mm. that practice which is buddhist so buddhism has a special place in my heart and his writings especially there's a book he did with um oh uh the bishop from south africa bishop tutu okay that they had a conversation about forgiveness and it's a fascinating book because it's based on kind of a, a couple hour conversation they have. And, and and I actually used it for a sermon series once, which people really liked because it was two really deeply spiritual folks that had worked out a lot of these issues around forgiveness and mercy. Mm -hmm. And they had a lot of wisdom to share. Um, but yeah, I, I get your point with the movie because uh if you don't don't know the story, you miss some of the stuff. Right. Um, like for example, he does it. He does it powerfully, but I worry that uh, people that may not know kind of miss it. Like one of the things that that uh, Tibetan Buddhist monks do is they do sand art. Right. And they'll make this sand piece, and they're beautiful, intricate pieces. They spend months, sometimes years, on making them. And when they're done, they destroy them. And you, he, he, he had flashes of their work throughout the film, and at the right. very, at a critical point, he see you see them destroy it. But if you don't know that they do that, it may not resonate why he's showing it. Right. Um, you know, they do it to teach themselves the reality of impermanence that everything is in, impermanent. Or, you know, everything that you do will fade and you can't rest yourself in you know your existence kind of thing um but yeah i mean i it's also powerful to me the story itself because um and i didn't know this till i did some research about 
what Babylon did when they took over Israel. But um, the Babylonians do a very similar thing to what the Chinese have done. I don't know if the Chinese copied <laughs> uh, the Babylonians or not, but the Babylonians would take over an area. They would identify the leadership. They would pull the leadership out of the area and then they would flood the area with Babylonians. The hope being that they would destroy the culture that they had just taken over. Uh -huh. And the Chinese have done the exact same thing. They have tried to remove the leadership of the Tibetan people. And then they have flooded the last, you know, 40 or 50 years, they have flooded Chinese citizens into Tibet with the hope of killing the Tibetan culture. Um, and so that's always a powerful thing because you're like, you're, to me, I've told this in sermons, you're seeing what happened to the, is the people of Israel. You're seeing a modern day example. Yeah. You know, um, which to me is powerful when you reflect on it. But um, yeah, I mean, and I think the other interesting thing about this, I didn't know until I tried to find the copy. And for the folks that may want to watch this movie, it's really hard to find a copy of this movie because the Chinese government has pressured Amazon, who made it, or not, not Amazon, um, Disney, who made it. They pressured Disney to hide it. They pressured Amazon not to put it on their streaming services. Mm -hmm. So you, you could find it on YouTube, and you can also buy a physical copy, but that's about your only option to see it. Pretty much, yeah, and that's that's what I did. I You know, because I have a, I have a sizable li library of DVDs and Blu-rays. So to me, buying another one was like, eh, okay, I found it used on Amazon for nine bucks, so... Um, which is what I did. And it was delivered while I was on vacation. So I really literally watched it like two nights ago. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and you know, I, I didn't have a lot of chance to read up on um, some of the reviews because I, I, what I like to do is take in what some Christian reviews say about it, right? The one that I did read was very critical of it for, um, you know, they were comparing it to another Scorsese film, to the the, um, the Last Temptation of Christ, right? Yeah. And how they felt that that was blasphemous, and that you know Scorsese was now glorifying the yeah. the Dalai Lama, and I and I I went, oh. okay, I mean I can see what you're saying, but yeah, I, I think you're you're throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Yeah, you know what I mean? I, I think that there's there's still value to the film yeah insofar at least as if you you look at this you know the dalai lama and how he dealt with this you know this particular one how he dealt with all of this political conflict yeah and there was never a moment when his inner turmoil became a, an outward response Yes. You know, like there was there were definitely you got flash scenes of what was going on in his head or what he was dreaming about. Okay. Um, and a lot of it was, you know, the the consequences to his country and, and the, you know, the death of the monks that he was working with and, and things like that. But you never saw that played out in real life in his responses to how the Chinese were treating them. Yeah, he did. It does an excellent example of how people that are grounded in compassion and love. And I would argue what one of the things we share with Buddhists is that we believe the center of how we act should be love and compassion. Right. Um, if you choose to live that kind of life, you have to think through your emotions before you act. Yeah. You have, you have to process them before you act. And it shows good examples of somebody who's very young. I mean, this movie probably isn't even 20 as he goes off. You know, the whole period is probably he's younger than 20 the entire time. Yeah. You know, you see a very disciplined response of I'm going to be loving and compassionate, even when it's hard. And right. that is definitely something I, I would argue Christians are called to do. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and at least from that perspective, you, you can, you, if you want to, say okay well that's scorsese glorifying buddhism at the expense of christianity okay i mean if you want to say that but at least to, you know particularly for our purposes in this podcast uh at least look at what is 
uh, useful? What can we learn as yeah. Christians, right? It doesn't have, you know, I don't have to become a Buddhist to be compassionate. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have to become a Buddhist to be loving. Uh, yeah, and yeah, and we also, I think it's, I think it's important to recognize that we can learn from other faith traditions and not become other faith traditions. We can right. say, there's something beautiful here in this practice, or there's something beautiful here in this idea, um, and say, how can I incorporate it into my faith without saying, okay, now that this is important to me, like meta meditation uh, is really important to me. I use it a lot, especially when I'm going through difficulties with somebody. Um, but I can still do that practice and be Christian. Right. I don't have to go like, well, that practice is important. Therefore, I must become Buddhist. And I think we would all be better served, Christians and otherwise, if we recognize we can learn from each other and be blessed by each other without this idea of we've got to avoid people of other traditions because they're going to somehow infect us. Right. Right. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a that's a fair assessment. I I, I was surprised um, that so much of the film really went into all of the you know, I didn't know the history. Right. Yeah. But that so much of it went into all of this political wrangling between China and Tibet. Yeah. Um, that that was really where the film, at least for me, it, it grabbed my attention more. Well, yeah. And, yeah, sorry, sorry. No, no, go ahead. It's fine. Well, what, what's funny is to kind of respond to that review that you read. Mm -hmm. I, I am fascinated by these three very spirit. I think a lot of Scorsese stuff has spiritual elements in it. But there's three films in particular that clearly are about, about faith and spirituality. It's this one, it's Passion of the Christ, and it's uh, the one we did a couple of weeks ago. Um, silence. Silence. Yeah. Um, which which I've had several people from my church tell me, I watched that. Oh, yeah. my goodness. I said, yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> yeah. But what's interesting is even... I think it's fascinating what he does with religion. And I don't see somebody who's who's a person that wants to jettison any religious tradition. I think he's somebody that sees religion, whether it's Christianity or Buddhism, as of as extreme value. But he's fascinated by how, how religion and faith can help you in the difficult moments of life. Because those three films are about these really difficult moments right. and how faith and how God and how spirituality um, can help you through them. Right. And certainly how, how different faiths are valued by different cultures, too. Uh, yeah. I mean, there's, there's definitely a sense of that. I, I'm, you know, I don't uh, I get we guess we often get asked that question like, you know, well, you're only Christian because you were born in, in a Christian country. If you'd been born in Tibet, you'd be Buddhist yeah uh, okay maybe yeah. so uh <laughs> you know i don't know i mean there, there's i think there's some truth to the ra reality that the cultures we are born into shape our understanding of stuff but what i what i think is completely wrong about Scorsese, Scorsese is i don't think he feels like christianity is bad even in temptation of the christ i don't think he's saying christianity is bad i think he wants to explore how does faith in this higher in this higher thing in this in in God and a higher purpose? How does that help you help the character through this horrible ordeal? Hmm. You know, he's not fascinated about religion when it's easy. He's fascinated about religion when it's hard. And and shouldn't we all be more fascinated about religion when it's hard? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Because, um, and we talked about that when we talked about silence, how, you know, people, particularly in the United States, don't really understand Christian oppression, don't really understand Christian persecution, yeah. um, you know, those, those sort of things. So, um, yeah, there was a, there were scenes in, uh, when he met, when the Dalai Lama went and met Mao. Yeah, Mao Zedong. And and he said, you know, and he said to him, you know, I, I don't want to I don't want to change your religion. I want to rid your country of it, because there was that Marxist statement. Religion is the opiate of the masses. Right. Religion is, yeah, that, that was one of the things there were two 
quotes in the movie that I thought it'd be fun for us to play around with. Mm -hmm. um, and that's one of them is this idea that often gets thrown out that religion is poison or religion is this thing that nullifies real the possibility of real change and real mm -hmm. justice. You know, the, the, the idea of Marx's famous quote about the opium of the masses is this idea that he was getting at the, the, the tension and the, and the injustice that the worker feels and rightfully should have something done about religion then comes kind of swoops in and deadens that feeling. So change really doesn't happen. Okay. And um, in my mind, as a person that really cares about justice, social justice work has done a lot of stuff around justice work throughout my ministry. That critique drives me nuts. Cause I feel like if you really listen to the prophets and if you really listen to Jesus, God's on the side of the oppressed and Christians are called to be on the side of the oppressed mm -hmm. and we're called not to just feed them, but to ask the difficult questions and do the difficult work so that they have food, you right. know, and they, they have a just society. And so to me, Christianity fuels my desire to make a better world. And it always frustrates me when you hear this kind of thing. Well, religion just, uh, you know, Religion just deadens the feeling, so we don't actually change. And I'm like, no, you're you're listening to the wrong religion. <laughs> I mean, th that is that is part of. Um, I don't think I have one here, but the 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 Jerusalem cross and those points of the Jerusalem cross and one of the you know works of piety and works of yeah. justice, justice, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, it is something we do talk about in yeah. in religious in in particularly Methodist doctrine. Yes, absolutely. Um, <laughs> so uh yeah you know but and and i guess that is the downfall we you know maybe one of the big divides in the mainstream church yeah. and as methodists we're not immune to this one of the big yeah. divides is that difference between a focus on uh, evangelism and yeah. a focus on social justice right yeah. and and then there's and and there doesn't seem to be an ability to do both yeah, well, that's that's the frustrating thing is I tell people I'm really weird in a lot of weird ways. But uh, <laughs> one of the weird ways was I came to seminary and I did not like, I did not uh, connect well when I started to learn about Presbyterian um, doctrine, especially Calvin. I just didn't. And so I needed to kind of find something else. And I was really taken, I really connected deeply with John Wesley's writings, especially his idea of social and hol holy, uh, social and personal holiness. Mm -hmm. That you're called to be close to God and draw closer to God, but you're also called to make help God make the the world, the kingdom of heaven on earth. Right, right. right. And I love that idea. But what was so funny was I fell in love with Wesley before I ever went to a Methodist church. And then what was interesting is I found that at every Methodist church they would either lean one direction or the other, but they would almost yeah. ignore the, the, so if there was a social justice church, they'd almost ignore the idea that, that it was important to grow personally holy. Right. Or if you went to another Methodist church and they really focused on personal holiness, they would go like, ah, social justice stuff. They're like, that doesn't matter that much. <laughs> and I'm like, no, no, no. He wanted you to do both. You're supposed to do both. It almost feels like we should be partnering like those two churches together, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. You two guys, you're going to share a pastor. Yeah. Uh, you're going to learn from each other because you're both doing it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> or or something. I mean, if you you take the two halves, you might make a whole, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. It's, it, it, is, it is an interesting uh, dichotomy, uh, particularly... You know, like we like I said, we see it really strongly. I mean, I think part of it is what's divided the denomination, really. Yeah. Um, you yeah. know, and I, I don't want to get too far off into those weeds necessarily, but you know, it, it's it's definitely an issue. No, it's it. You know, it's it is. It's hard to get certain Methodists that really care deeply about making a just world to recognize that you also need to help people connect with God. Right. You know, 
And I feel like this, it's the flip of the coin. For people that really care deeply about evangelism and this idea of helping people connect with God and grow toward God, that sometimes it's real. They're very, they very, they very much push back when you say, okay, there's homeless people down the street. We need to talk to our, not just go feed them, but we actually need to talk to our, our, our council, our city council about how do we change laws so that there's less need for people to have to sleep on the street? You know, like, how can we make less homelessness? You know, that, those kind of questions. And yeah, it is frustrating because I really think Wesley is right, that you're supposed to do both. You're supposed to have a deep, enriching, personal connection with God that changes you and makes you more Christ-like. But that Christ-likeness will then compel you to make want to make the world a better more compassionate more loving and more just place right 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 because after all what is the kingdom of god here on earth yeah what is it yeah no um and and i, I think both sides need to be able to come to uh, both sides i'm both sizing things but yeah. be able to come to an agreed upon definition of what that means you know, well, it's not just personal, right? Well, I, I think, honestly, if you don't have both, you end up distorting what you do. And oftentimes you end up burning yourself out. Yeah. That that they both are there to really replenish you, you know, and to help fuel you so that you can continue to do the work of God. Right, right. The other thing that I... The quote that kind of caught me and I thought it might be interesting to talk about is he said at one point uh, the Chinese government starts playing um, sounds like propaganda. We don't get it translated, but it sounds like propaganda stuff a lot during the day on speaker loudspeakers. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was interesting uh, that Dalai Lama says they have taken away our silence. And mm. I think to me, I don't know about you, I've never talked to you about this, but I feel like one of the hardest things to do as a pastor in my American context is to help my congregation realize they have to pull away, they have to unplug, sometimes they have to be in silence. They have to listen for God. They yeah. have to meditate. They have to shut up and kind of just kind of be there in that uncomfortable silence and allow God to speak to them. Yeah. Um, you know, have, have, have you tried? Um, I, I'm sure you probably have, but uh, I, I find that like, if you ever do this, you take your, your prayer time in the worship okay. service and then you just don't say anything. <laughs> People get, I mean, and it, oh take long about 10 or 15 seconds and people are really uncomfortable oh yeah oh my god i <laughs> like I, I don't have to go a minute i can go 15 seconds and people are squirming <laughs> oh people it's it's amazing and, and i mean i notice it myself it's not like i'm i have worked through this at all true but the reality is yeah i've i've done five minutes once and i thought you would have thought i I tried to blow up the sanctuary after I was over. People were like, please never do that again. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, it was five minutes, people. Like, <laughs> Yeah, that is that. And it's definitely one of the spiritual disciplines, right? I mean, it's something that we're, we're encouraged to do. Um, it's, you know, maybe you'll hear it in a different way. You might, for folks that are listening, you may have heard it uh, called listening to God. Well, because we talk so much, and if you're talking, you're not listening. Yeah. You know, if you're filling your attention with uh, this thing, you yeah. know, or, or whatever, you're not listening. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, it, it's it's probably one of the hardest, at least one of the two hardest things for us to to manage. I think yeah. as Christians, that and fasting. Because people don't want to give stuff up, but well, and you know, <laughs> yeah. What's I think what is, I mean, to me, it's it's very sad 
because one of the things that I have always found fascinating about studying other religions, whether Buddhism or Islam or anything, is they don't all, I don't agree with the idea that they all say the same thing. They don't. Mm -hmm. but, but you will notice that in every tradition, there are certain things that pop up. So, for example, every tradition I've ever studied has practices built in that are centered in silence in some way. Whether that be meditation, whether that be here, the Jesus prayer, which is a breath prayer. Right. You know, um, but it's this idea. Every every religion has this kind of practice. And to me, when you see it throughout human existence, to me, it's a time where you go, huh, there might be a reason not to keep showing up. You know, like, you know, maybe God works through that. And and yeah, I think one of the things that's frustrated me as a Protestant pastor is how hard sometimes I have to sell people on the necessaries of doing spiritual practices. Yeah. You know, they'll be like, well, do we really have to fast? And I'm like, yeah, you do. Like, like we can do fasting well, in different ways. No, the, the response is, do you really want to grow? Yes. Yes, you're right. The response is, <laughs> do you want to be like Jesus? Okay. Then... then... <laughs> <laughs> then, then perhaps the fact he fasts regularly in the bible should be something you think about <laughs> and, and went away and practiced silence by himself you know what i i had to say it was it was literally like six years ago this week um i did a spiritual retreat and i went by myself and you know i went to a little a little retreat place down in south carolina and just spent the week doing nothing but reading and looking at the woods and <laughs> you know and you know walking around i mean it was really nice yeah. um you know so yeah that's uh that's that's easily something i think maybe you know the folks that listen and uh you know we as pastors really have to to um lean into a little more you know uh it it changes and again that gives you it gives you that skill right of of taking the pause and and evaluating before you respond which goes right back to the movie and and how the dalai lama responded you know yeah i i, I definitely think this movie is fascinating to watch the history of this group of people that most of us don't know anything about and 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 how again the Western world, including us, just went like, "Yeah, we're not going to pay attention to it," you know, which which was wrong. But yeah, well, this film got like almost zero box. It got very very low box office, right? Yeah, uh, and again, it's sad to think that the Chinese government or any government, I'd be upset if America did this, but to basically kill a film because it's critical of you. And because you have the power to do that, that's that says something about our culture too. Yeah. You know. Um, but yeah, I think it's a really good example of someone in a very difficult situation and them teaching themselves to think about compassion and love before they act. And yeah. even if you're not Buddhist, the reality is Christianity is supposed to be centered our actions are supposed to be centered around love and compassion. It's worth thinking about and, and learning about. Yeah. 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 And at least, at least from that perspective, the film is worth finding and watching is yeah. I think is our kind of our final say on it. Uh, you know, I, if you've got a better attention span than me, then you might <laughs> do better with the film. I, I struggled at least initially to get into it, but that's, that is completely on me. It's a, it's a busy week. Uh, so that's, we'll put that, we'll put that aside. I think it's a, I think it's a worthwhile film. Yeah. It's a worthwhile film. So we have to talk about, uh, what we will watch for next week. Um, and this really was your choice. Uh, Kundun was your choice. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of on me to pick a film. Um, and we know that that is an extreme challenge trying to pick a film that Jonathan has not seen. <laughs> um, 
So, and, and, you know, we could, I mean, I could go back to the well and just draw, draw an anime film back out again, you know, because, sure. but, uh, because that's a, that's a genre that I enjoy. Yeah. But, um, you know, we get back into the Japanese culture on that and, and we talked a bit about that. So, I, you know, I don't know if that's something we want to okay. necessarily do. Um, and, and even though we had a little bit of this discussion by a text earlier the week, mm -hmm. uh, even though I have seen Deadpool and Wolverine already, yeah, I'm not sure if that's a film that we want to talk about for church folks. Yeah, probably not. Um, now, I did talk to a person from the church today who has seen it and loved it. Yeah, yeah. I enjoyed it, and I would recommend it if and only if. If you know what you're doing. Yeah. Seen the yes what you're getting yourself into yep. don't run out and see deadpool and wolverine just because it's a really popular film right now because it is very violent it is very graphic it is very uh there's a lot of foul i mean a lot of foul language <laughs> it's not it is not a family film by any stretch of the imagination oh. um are could one find redeeming christian values in it perhaps or mm -hmm. even even Christian critiques, yeah. Or yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, at least Christian critiques, certainly. Um, but I, I don't know that we want to put that on the list necessarily to, you know, to talk about for folks. Uh, because, well, one, I laugh so much, I don't know if I could get through the, the podcast without losing my... <laughs> yeah, and, there, and, and again, like I, like I told you, there was a lot of inside baseball. So if you don't know the background of the actors or the... The issues in Marvel, you're going to miss a lot. So, of I mean, goodness gracious, there are so many cameos and callbacks and, you know, yeah. inside jokes. And I mean, there's one joke in there that I was the only one when I went to see it, I was the only one in the theater that laughed because I knew the joke yeah. all the way back to the comic book origins of the character. OK, yeah. uh, and I read the comic book back in the 90s. So. Yeah. You know, but most of the people sitting there like that, that joke was on the screen and nobody but me laughed. Yeah. <laughs> you know? so, um, I don't know what is. Uh, what it, it's just silly to ask you what you haven't seen, isn't it? You know? <laughs> yeah. I don't know, John, uh, what films have you not seen? <laughs> uh, yeah um honestly just is there something that you're interested in throwing out uh i don't know um i've only got about four minutes left so <laughs> i better come up with something <laughs> i i have i have something do you want me to go twice uh well you can what do you got uh, have you ever seen primary colors no, I don't think I have. It doesn't ring a bell. Okay. It, it's, I, I love politics. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's about, it was written by a reporter. Uh, an, uh, 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 starting, it, he wrote it as an, a book, Anonymous. But it was Joe Klein, I think his name was. And he wrote about the 92 election, the first election of, of Bill Clinton. Okay. And it's a movie kind of around, it has a, a, a fictional name and the characters are fictional but it's basically kind of centered around the clintons and the 92 campaign and okay. i thought with all the campaign stuff and political stuff floating around it might be interesting to for us to take something that was in the 90s and talk about you know those kind of issues and and uh, and and try to do the discussion without getting too political yeah because exactly. you know, because let's be honest now yeah, yeah. Politics is tearing yeah. folks apart. Okay. Oh yes. Well, and that's that's why yeah. I thought it might be interesting for us to take a political movie and talk about kind of the Christian ways we can kind of address the issues. So yeah, I, I think that's a great idea, actually, um, because you know it's no secret you and I are on different pages when it comes to yeah. politics. You and I and Evan are on different pages when it comes to politics, yeah. and so that'll be a great discussion, I think. So we'll we'll watch that. Primary Colors. It's a 1998 film. Yep. Um, I John Travolta's in it. 
Yeah, John Travolta's in it. It is on Amazon Prime Video, yeah. um, YouTube, Google Play. Yeah. So at least it's it's a little easier to find than Kundun was. Yes. Sorry <laughs> about that. And for those uh, for those who do watch regularly, uh, we want do want to ask you to keep Evan in your prayers. Um, he is he was going to be with us today. Uh, he had to uh, beg off because uh, he had a pastoral emergency. Uh, so he's dealing with an issue um, uh, with a, a parishioner. And uh, so we're going to ask you to keep him in your prayers and his church in your prayers this week. That's uh, Brick UMC um, in Brick, New Jersey. Yeah. And um, other than that, primary colors for next week. Um, thank you all for watching, friends. Take care and keep on finding God in the dark. Bye. Bye now. Thanks for watching the Finding God in the Dark podcast. If you're enjoying these discussions, please consider hitting the like button down below or subscribing to follow along. We put out weekly episodes on Friday mornings. And we are so glad that you're finding this discussion of theology and film entertaining enough to follow along with us. Take care and God bless, friends.